Welcome everyone to Partner Up with Amy Carroll. As a communication coach, trainer, speaker, and author, I'm delighted to be your host and excited to bring you insights and ideas to help you solve your communication conundrums. This is the 55th episode of my show, Partner Up with Amy Carroll. If you want to find out more about me or what the show is about, feel free to listen to previous episodes on my website, carolcoaching.com, or go directly to the voiceamerica.com business channel. And be sure to download the app or tune in using your favorite podcast app. Now, if you missed last week's show, it was a replay of my interview with the nationally recognized family therapist, author, and teacher, Terry Real. It was focusing on his inspiring work and wealth of knowledge. We took a deep dive into just a few of the strategies Terry talks about in his book, The New Rules of Marriage, another show not to be missed. Now, today, my guest is Matthew Stillman. Welcome, Matthew. Hello. So, um, Matthew, I want to start with a bio that I put together um, when I was learning about you. And listeners, I want to share this with you. And I think of an analogy, like it's like reading to you a list of appetizers and maybe a few items off the main course from your favorite all-time restaurant menu. Though it is certainly not an exhaustive list of Matthew's many accomplishments and contributions. And uh, I believe the description of Renaissance man is going to give you a good idea of what might describe Matthew. Okay, here goes. Matthew is a writer, creator, connector, guider, a deep listener, a professional problem solver, a reimaginer, a former program development executive at Food Network, an improviser, a scholar with Stephen Jenkins at the Orphan Wisdom School, a documentary filmmaker. We'll talk more about that later student and practitioner of Eastern mystical traditions, as well as in history, science, movement, ancestral health, psychology, and philosophy. Oh, and one more amazing uh, piece to add to the menu of human being, Matthew launched his own natural skincare line called Prima Derma. So I say it again, Primal. Primal. Oh, thank you. Somebody correct me on that when I was saying it and they, and I, uh, I have a tendency to to get creative with words, primal derma. Yeah, that fits very well with what the, the product is. Um, so Matthew, um, any, any thoughts for you after listening to that description of yourself? Does that feel kind of accurate? Like hit the um, marks? Well, it's, uh, I don't know if any of it's true. We'll see if I can stand up to such a description uh, in the next time that we have. <laughs> Well, one thing, you know, Matthew, I, um, the topic I was really eager to, to discuss with you is improv, and we share a passion for improv. Um, I started studying it on the West Coast at uh, Bay Area Theater Sports, and you started on the East Coast at uh, the Upright Citizens Brigade. And um, for listeners who may not know what improv is, and there's, of course, there's performance improv, and there's improv woven into life. And I think I'm guessing we're, we're doing both you and I, how would you define improv for listeners? Um, well, theatrical improv, uh, there are two broad styles, short form and long form. Um, but it's a notion of a type of performance where suggestion or suggestions are made by the audience during the show to inspire the performers to make up uh, scenes or scene um, that is completely unscripted and will never be seen again. And it's a, uh, I mean, I have my own biases that long form is a particular uh, sort of type of magic that's unique, that's very different than short form. Mm -hmm. Um, But they're both, you know, take a tremendous amount of mental acuity teamwork, um, listening, um, a sense of play and uh, dynamicism that comes out. And so I was very lucky to start studying with the Upright Citizens Brigade virtually at the very beginning of their uh, advent in New York and studied with them and played on their stage for more than 20 years. Uh, The first 10 years of that, I was more central in the I was in the center of the orbit more, just performing a lot Mm -hmm. and having that be a part of my life. And the last 10 other things emerged and I was still around uh, and played and was lucky to. You know, you were saying something that I wanted to ask about um, 
what do you particularly like about long form? You started to say a little bit. So tell me more about that. So if you, if your listeners aren't familiar, the two types are short form and long form broadly, of course there are others, but those are a lot of them fit into that category. Short form is if you've ever seen the show, which I know you have, but um, a show like Whose Line Is It Anyway? Right. Uh, which, and so what that show is, is short form improv, which is that you get, you know, in a show, maybe 10, 20, 30 suggestions. And if something is, you can make something funny out of, you know, a screwdriver or you know, everybody wants to eat a peanut or whatever it is, whatever the suggestions are, if it's funny, that's great. If it's not funny, it's over and nothing is really connected. You know, there may be mm. some sort of like a particular callback because it just sort of happens organically, but it means you're always driving to a punchline yeah. uh, to end the thing so you can get to another suggestion, which is not a bad thing, but it just sort of means they're all separate. With long form, you get one suggestion and you go for 20 minutes, a half an hour, sometimes longer. And so that means that if something's funny, you can't stay there. And if something's not funny, you have to find a way to weave that into the larger structure. And so it requires... You mean sus- justifying the thing that's not funny? Well, justifying it or finding a way to weave it in. And not that funny is the only thing, but just making right. every everything matters Okay. Uh, in long form. Whereas in short form, if it's not funny, you can forget about it because there's another suggestion of, you know, you know, whatever it is that's coming up. Mm-hmm. So you can forget about it. Mm-hmm. Have you ever heard of playback theater? Uh, I have not. So playback is a form of improv. And I learned about it about five years ago, went to a camp on it in Ser- Serbia, I think, had an amazing experience and fell in love with it. And then when I came back to the town where I live in, I said, I have to find this, I have to study it, and found a course that was beginning two weeks later in French. And my French is kind of like questionable. And uh, the woman convinced me, no, you'll be fine. So I've been doing playback in French for uh, for five years now. Um, the great bonus is my French is starting to finally get better. And playback, what happens is you tell the stories of the audience. So you have a conductor who interviews people, and then sometimes we'll get what they call the deep stories. Um, and then we have these different forms we use. So I get to do the short form improv with a bunch of scientists in English. And then I do the French um, playback or the playback in French. Um, and it's it's therapeutic for us. It's therapeutic for the audience. And it's a completely different experience. Oh, yeah. So I, I didn't know it by that name. Um, there mm-hmm. are certainly, so that reminds me of uh, Theater of the Oppressed, yeah. um, which is Amazing. And then, of course, there are lots mm. of long form mm. improv styles which use this format of interviewing people uh, about their stories and using that as a foundation to explore that. And you can do that through looking at their Facebook page, or you can look at that by looking at what's in their wallet or in their purse. Mm-hmm. And I've uh, seen plenty of long form improv. So it's a form of a long form narrative improv, mm-hmm. which is great. I, I've done those types of shows, not particularly the structure of that. It also reminds me a little bit of um, Family Constellations. Yep. Uh, uh, as well. So, yeah. So, um, going into more detail, when you first studied at Upright Citizens Brigade, so Amy Poehler, a yep. uh, very talented actor, comedian, and improviser. So, she was one of your first teachers, and she had this quote. Go ahead. Yeah, she was my very first teacher. Very first. Oh, wow. Um, so, the stage was her, uh, she said that the stage was her church and improv was her religion. And she believed that if that improv could teach us something about being a better person. And I totally share this opinion. I really feel like improv has the capacity to make, you know, most human beings on the planet, kinder, gentler, sexier human beings. Maybe. <laughs> and um, so you asked yourself, if improv was Amy's religion and it could teach us about being a better person, could religion teach us anything about improv? Mm-hmm. And, it, and is that, was that the catalyst then to you writing this book about the Ten Commandments? Yep, it was. Um, I found Amy, I mean, I found, I was at the Upper Citizens Brigade's first show in New York. I just didn't know who they were. I just randomly went to the, the theater they happened to be in and I was completely mesmerized. I had never seen anything like it. I had heard of long form improv, but had literally never seen it. Um, 
And there it was. And I just like, I need to do this. And so when I started the Upright Citizens Brigade in uh, April or May of 1996, right after I graduated college, um, I mean, like days after I graduated college, and I'd seen that show in January, like I had been waiting, like obviously to start my career in my life, but I was like, I need to start this. I found working with Amy and all the UCB um, so magnetic and there were very few people doing it at the time. So it really was like being in on a real uh, remarkable secret. And I found her such a, a great person and a remarkable improviser. And so when she said that, it really, even though she was only, I guess, two years older than I was, so we're peers in one way, mm -hmm. she just was this iconic performer and another, even at that time where she wasn't anything close to being famous. Right. Or maybe how maybe she was very close to being famous then, and um, but she wasn't famous. And so we had this proximity. And so this really felt like um, like a real bolt of insight. And so for me, I've always been a, I guess I'd say a meaning making soul. Mm -hmm. And when she said that about what improv was to her and how the improv is her religion and the stage is her church, um, it made me think that it, um, that it had to be the other way. And so I was just started to wonder, um, well, you know, the Ten Commandments are sort of like a famous, like what to do, uh, how to be in the world. And I just started to think, huh, these, there has to be a way that this relates to improv. And so I wrote a, a small book uh, called A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to Mount Sinai, uh, The Ten Commandments as a Guide to Long-Form Improvisational Comedy, which obviously is a huge bestseller. Uh, I'm I mean, sure. I mean, huge, <laughs> Tre <laughs> tremendous. Book signings so, uh, constantly. <laughs> I mean, the, yeah, the residuals on it are pretty spectacular. It was uh, the hardcover book by Scribner. <laughs> Um, well, I tried to get my hands yeah. on it, and I can I can see I, I can get it through um, Gumroad, uh, yeah. Amazon. Where? How else could I get it? You can get it on Gumroad. I mean, it's it's out there. I mean, it, it was uh, a, a small little rinky dink pub publisher published it. It's like you know, no one buys it anymore. Every once in a while, like if you wanted, I'm happy to send you a copy. Oh, thanks. Um, uh, sure. Um, I mean, I'm being generous. Like maybe it's sold. 400 or 500 copies, but like it was all improvisers who bought it. Right. Um, oh, hey, by the way, um, uh, I'm going to pause for a second about this conversation. Do you know what AIN is? Applied Improv Network. I've heard of it. I don't, never involved. Okay. So where I'm involved, because I use a lot of improv in my work professionally, and um, we've got a conference coming up. It's the first online conference. So, uh, and we'll have a book. Um, a book section so um i'll propose your book to to see if um people because <laughs> it'll okay. be a whole it's 200 improvisers <laughs> okay sure <laughs> they'll be like hey haven't heard of this one <laughs> yeah they definitely have them <laughs> so i i'd love to take a few minutes to hear some of the connections uh maybe there's some stories behind them uh with the ten commandments because there's a lot of not coveting in the Ten Commandments and not doing stuff and not. Well, there's killing. not a lot of. There's not a lot of not coveting. There's one tenth of it is not coveting. There's there's not covet. I, I had to look it up. Not the neighbor or the neighbor's goods. Yeah, the neighbor's that's true. wife or the neighbor's goods. So that's twenty percent right there. Not sure of, of that particular commandment, but there are ten. So like that's the <laughs> that's the not coveting clause. So um, what were what, do you remember some of the connections you made in the book? Sure. I mean. Um, I mean, an easy one is, you know, honor thy father and mother. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, you know, from, from a biblical perspective, this is about respecting your origins, um, mm -hmm. on, honoring them. And so in improv, this was, this is also true in the sense that what someone says first is true. So, the, and even later in the show, it's still true. Um, the there's a famous uh, among improvisers um, story about an improvised scene that was done between Del Close, sort of like the the grandfather of uh, or the godfather of long form improv that he was doing on stage with Joan Rivers, like the famous Joan Rivers. 
And the scene as de was described was uh, Del and Joan are on the stage and he says, you know, darling, you know, there's some problem with the children. And Joan Rivers response was, we don't have any children. And it got a huge laugh because Joan Rivers is hilarious and, you know, they made it work, but it was like a classic denial. Um, and so I expanded on this, of course, in the book, but so there's this notion that what you establish first needs to be respected in, in order for there to be any sort of semblance of uh, structure or movement for the, the culture of the scenes or the show to emerge. Mm -hmm. It makes me think of uh, something I read in another improv book, Training to Imagine by Kat Coppett. So mm -hmm. she talks about being on stage and she's, uh, she and this guy are playing husband and wife. And um, she's, I, I guess, uh, pretending to have a gun. And he says to her, you know, what do you have in your hand? And she says, it's a gun. And he says, no, it's not. Okay, you know, classic block. And she said, honey, I put a milk carton over it so I wouldn't scare the kids. <laughs> Yeah. And I just, I thought, what an exquisite, elegant way to make your partner look good, accept the offer that was just a block towards your, to yours, keep your ego out of it. Yep. And, and, and then, you know, bring even more joy to the scene. Totally. And that, that that's great. And that, that um, is a great fix from a generous player. Um, yes. And the easier thing is right it's a gun don't block in the first place no. uh, unless you're sophisticated enough players that you that's part of the game is to block Correct. each other right so that's a whole different thing so Correct. another i mean we can go through all 10 if you're uh, desperate but another one is to honor the sabbath and keep it holy and for me what this you know you could again make what of the theological perspective of what that might mean is uh why saturdays or sundays are important to um to honor that but for me and from the improv perspective was that you need to sometimes rest and stop on stage taking moments of pauses which seem interminable to you are actually allow the audience to rest because you're in an uh i wouldn't ever say like the audience is the god and the stage the performers are the people or that the other way around but just at rest is important for the whole thing to exist. Mm -hmm. Taking taking beats, there's such um, there's such an energy that happens on stage, whether you're doing short, long or short form, to always go and always yep. go faster, yep. and to be sort of manically addicted to the laugh. Yep. And so this is just as important that the fact that the Ten Commandments said that 10% of, of our laws are about rest and about space. And, uh -huh. and you know, you know, there's, a, there's a famous poem by William Wordsworth that he wrote in 1803, uh, that if it was true then, it was still true now, but he says, the world is too much with us. Late and soon getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours. We've given our hearts away, a sordid boon. And it goes on, but but you know, there's so much of the the societal influence that we have, which is just like keep going, right. keep going more, get get and spend. And so we get and spend on stage all the time. Yeah. And so the uh, honor the Sabbath and keep it holy is restraint. Yeah. Restraint in general. So yeah. And what we forget is that that's an element of improv that's really fascinating for the audience to watch. Oh, sure. And um, I've been um, encouraging some of my colleagues in the with the French improv, improv troupe because their tendency is to want to talk a lot. Is So I, I said sometimes because my French is limited, because something has happened and I don't know what's happened, I have this game, which is um, if you can't sing, sing loud, mm -hmm. which ironically is opposite of sounds opposite though it's the I'll walk onto stage if something has to happen and no one else is volunteering I force myself onto that stage um, and I'm just still and I've done it enough times that I trust the process that something or someone's gonna 
you know, save the day or I'm going to have an idea. And um, so often when I can slow down and calm down, the, you know, there's an inspiration or a transformation or, or just a, a fun thing. Um, so that's, I love tying it back to the Sabbath. And then the yeah. other piece is um, living in Switzerland. They voted a number of years ago about kind of something the law was sort of like, um, should we let all the shops be open on Sundays too? Because they had been closed, most of them, with some exceptions. And they voted, no, we want to keep them closed. And of course, being you know the extroverted American that I am and wanting to always um, be a little too busy, I was not happy about that, mostly, except Matthew, there was a part of me that was kind of like, oh, thank God, because I wouldn't have chosen it for myself. Thank, thank you for choosing it, choosing it for me. But yeah. I should say, thank God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So is there anything else that you want to uh, bring up about the book or stories that you uh, want to connect around the improv? Um, I mean, nothing specific. I guess I could also say that um, but while I don't enjoy writing at all, I mean, it's really not a pleasure of mine. The idea was so clear to me um, that it sort of needed to be written. And I just sort of followed the, the desire to, to work on it. I mean, the, you know, why write a book that you know that is not going to be successful? I mean, I had no illusion that this was going to be some sort of um, blockbuster or even um, minor blockbuster. Like even, I didn't even think this was going to be like a cult classic among improvisers. <laughs> Although a lot of improvisers have read it and thought like, oh, this is interesting. Um, you know, it's more a thought piece than a, right. than anything else. But I don't know, I think there's just something about saying yes to the idea when it came really clearly. Yeah. It's funny uh, to hear you say that you don't like to write. Um, Hate it. I kind of hate it too. Ugh, gross. Why do what? Why do you hate about it? Maybe it's just to help me explain myself. Um, I mean, for me, it, it is domesticating speech. I think that there are so many tendrils to ideas which I want to be able to follow off, um, and so, like, for me to think about things, to research things, to talk about them, is I'm delighted by all that. But then to somehow have to rope it in mm. and say, well, this it's not even a matter about killing your darlings. It's not that at all. It's just that it, it always feels flatter and less alive mm -hmm. um, for me. It doesn't mean that I haven't written well or can't. I, right. mean, I, do, write, <laughs> I, do, I do write well, but yeah. the, actual, the actual process of, right. uh, of, let's just call it breaking the horse. It's like, oh, okay, great. Has to be done. Has to be done. And it's no fun. Yeah, I, um, I'm like you. I don't enjoy writing. I'm a good wordsmith. I'm okay at it. And uh, a friend of mine said, you know, Amy, you should write a book. And I was like, you're insane. No. And she said, no, no, no. A combination of all the stories you already tell in your workshop. I was like, oh, okay. I think I could do that. <laughs> and it still but took I, three years. <laughs> yeah. It's a nightmare to write. I mean, it, someone can say that like, oh, it's just easy. But even when you dictate it, it's just like, oh, God. So yeah. unpleasant. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Um, so the um, the last thought I have about talking about the improv, and we may revisit it later before, after the break, is um, the joy it gives me when I bring the concepts of improv into my real life. And I, it makes, do you, have you ever heard of contact improv? Of course, yeah. Okay, Done good. Of it. Uh, okay, good. Oh, that doesn't surprise me. So for listeners, contact improv is like a form of dance where you're moving um, in unison with others or in partnership and, and in and out. And it's very, very organic. And it's it can sometimes feel like you're having sex with strangers with your clothes on. I've had that experience a couple of times. It's a little weird um, because I and I say that in the sense that it's so it can be so intimate. And this one guy I met who does a lot of contact improv, he said, you know, I got to be really careful 
Because when I walk into a grocery store and maybe it's crowded and I rub up against someone and I sort of do a, you know, a rolling over their shoulder. And he said, you know, he can get me in trouble because that's what his body wants to organically do when he's doing contact improv. And it just carries into the real world when he's on a busy street or in a busy shop or something. And it kind of makes me think of the concepts of, of performance improv and how I'm, I'm always saying, you know, how I'm in this exchange with someone, how can I make this person look good? Do you find yourself doing that? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't even try to do it. I mean, I think that I've done it long enough that uh, I do it. Uh, right. And like, and any good improviser, or even the best improvisers, of course, fuck up on stage uh, and fuck up in life. So of course, like it doesn't always happen, but I think it's pretty intrinsic. But I would say to that, uh, it's a little bit heartbreaking about hearing about that man who just sort of couldn't contain himself from doing contact improv. It reminds me of the sort of person who um, does method acting so hard that they can't stop being the character. Mm. And so that for me is just an implication of like, oh, you actually have not followed the, the, the law of this, uh, following the Sabbath. Like there actually is a mm -hmm. time where you like stop mm -hmm. this because you don't walk around thinking you're Ophelia when you're not on stage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So mercy to him, mercy to, <laughs> mercy to all of us. Yes, true. Hey, so um, we're gonna pause for a moment here and listeners, if you wanna connect with, find out more about Matthew, you can go directly to his website, stillmansays.com and that's S-T-I-L-L-M-A-N-S-A-Y-S.com. And if you're ready to join me for, to take your superhero partner powers into the next decade, join me for my online leadership course. You can find details on my website, carolcoaching.com. When we come back from the break, we'll be hearing more from Matthew. So stay tuned. You're listening to Partner Up with Amy Carroll on the Voice America Business Channel. Welcome back to Partner Up with Amy Carroll. My guest today is Matthew Stillman. And um, I first learned about Matthew through my good friend, Emma, who you know told me I needed to interview him. And um, so listeners, I want to now take you to in another direction. Uh, Matthew, um, when you met Emma, it was in Canada, I believe, when, and you are um, a scholar with Stephen Jenkins at the Orphan Wisdom School. So I want Jenkinson. you to, Jenkins. Jenkinson. Jenkinson. Oh, wow. I've mistyped that twice. Okay, thanks. Sure. Stephen Jenkinson's. So um, questions for you are, um, how would you describe his work? What is the Orphan Wisdom School? And then what does it mean to be a scholar with him? Um, <clears throat> Stephen Jenkinson is, a, um, is a, a writer, an author, um, a uh, ceremonialist, a, a practitioner of deep living, a canoe builder, a sculptor, architectural designer, um, poet, um, And he has a school called the Orphan Wisdom School. Oh, and he's written uh, four books, um, Die Wise, uh, A Manifesto for Sanity and Soul, Come of Age, um, Making a Case for Elderhood in a Time of Trouble, uh, Money and the Soul's Desires and How It All Could Be. Um, and then he has, uh, oh, and he just one just came out called A Generation's Worth. Um, Making Meaning in a Time of Plague, if I recall. That might be the subtitle. And then he has an upcoming book coming out about matrimony. Um, but a lot of people, if you know about Stephen Jenkinson, a lot of people think about him as being the grief guy or the deaf guy. Right. Um, and so he has a school called the Orphan Wisdom School, um, which is a, uh, a two-year uh, school. We meet every six months for five or six days, um, which is a bit of the unauthorized history of uh, North America and Europe and how that relates to our cultural lack of capacity for the skill of grief and connection to ancestry and place. Our cultural lack of capacity. For the skill of grief. Mm -hmm. Meaning that our cultures don't teach us how to deal with it, is that? 
not just deal with it, uh, have the skill to contend with, with, with developing it. It's not just a, a feeling, but there actually is a skill of grief. Mm -hmm. um, and that there's not an ancestral poverty that we've been denied. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and so why is it called orphan wisdom? So, I mean, there was a time, of course, where orphans happened, ex existed in the world. And even if you were an orphan, you still might be sustained by the culture that you were inhabited. It doesn't mean okay. that there weren't traumas and bad things happened. Of course there were. Um, and so here we are in, in the West, and that includes Europe, um, who are functionally orphans. You know, there's not a strong sense of where we came from. Right. You, know, you might sort of know like, oh, I'm Italian or I'm whatever, but there's no real deep sense that you belong to that. Because there's a sense that you could sort of go anywhere um, and do anything and there's no real boundaries to you. Um, and so of course, you know, once upon a time, there was a wisdom to being an orphan. And so part of what, maybe what some of the spirit work of our generation is to find the wisdom of being the type of orphans that we, and I use the word, we uh, cautiously um, might be able to make. And then what it means to be a scholar. Um, it's a, it's a rigorous process of contending with the stuff that Stephen Jenkinson puts out to us and to carry on with it. And uh, it's, a, it's a title that he sort of gives to, broadly to the people who have taken to study with him. And I don't say that I've done it better or worse than anyone else. Um, but because of my particular proclivities, I have a more sort of like traditionally scholarly bent. And so mm. I have brought that um, more academic scholarship to the scholarship of the Orphan Wisdom School and my involvement there for the last seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure what question I wanna ask next. It's more like, with all of your experience there, the seven to eight years, um, I'd be curious to hear some of the the sweetness in in some of those experiences. Are there, and of course, heartbreaking. You know, before you and I started the recording today, you you asked me a question about you know what is it, what's something like what's your what's breaking your heart open today, um, and and so I guess that that's inspired me to ask, you know, knowing that the work that Stephen Jenkinson does is so uh, profound, um, what, what memories and inspirations um, would you be open to sharing? Um, geez, there's, there's so many to say. Um, well, where I met Emma, who you and I both know, um, we were there on a, a week long uh, apprenticeship doing doing farm work, basically mm -hmm. um, working, you know, setting up fences and clearing brush, cutting down trees, etc. Um, and it was properly hard work, uh, interspersed with reflections on. What do fences ask of us and why have fences emerged or why are we cutting down um someone asked while we were cutting down these trees during a break so you know, why are we cutting down all these trees like don't we need more trees in the world um and we were cutting down i mean i'm making up the number but it was you know well over and these were you know, small trees but we, we cut down you know easily over a thousand trees in the week that we were there um and someone asked in a very sincere way, like, why are we, like, we need more trees in the world, like tree planting is so good. And Stephen Jenkinson took that opportunity during this break to say, you know, you know, it's an interesting wondering. We do, like we're sold this story, which is not wrong, we do. 
need more trees in the world. And let's ask why have these trees that we're cutting down, why are they here? And what happened that made them be here? And just so happens, he says, well, this place was um, not particularly good farmland, but Irish immigrants were driven here based on what was happening in Ireland and they couldn't farm or couldn't farm much. So the only way that they could start to make any sort of living based on the poverty that they were driven from and the poverty that they found themselves in was to start to plant fast growing trees for timber so they could live and sell. Well, just so happens that that fast growing wood made the poor soil, poor soil even poorer and it was functionally like bringing an invasive species into the neighborhood. And he said, so what we're doing is we're trying to have the land as it was, have a little bit of a chance. And we're not gonna be able to do it in our lifetimes at all. So it's not such as simple as more trees good. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly like, that was an amazing, and he took you know 15 or 20 minutes to sort of play that out. But here was like an honest question um, and hard, sweaty work, and suddenly putting it to cut into a much deeper context and consequence of, oh, wow, history. Oh, wow, this place. Oh, wow, the, the fertility of the land itself. Huh. Then this way that there are, well, I have no ancestry in that part of the world, but the ancestors, some of the ancestors of that place were still walking there because they had planted these these trees that had taken over or not totally taken over but had greatly expanded their original uh, uh, purpose so that's one mm -hmm. um i mean the number of things that broke my heart there are more than i could count yeah um and the things that also you know cooked me and made me um yeah so many and just the story you shared now, um, the, the idea of doing something for a future where we won't exist in it is, you know, um, I, I guess, I guess if I look at my life, there's maybe some things I'm, you know, that's, I am intending to contribute to things that won't impact me. You know, I won't be around for, for the results. Um, though I, I'm, I'm uh, taken aback by that forward thinking, that long-term thinking. Yeah. My brain doesn't always go there. It's pretty, tends to be short-term. Of course, but I mean, um, that's the, the times, that's the water that we've been swimming in, which is right. short-termism. Short so uh, it takes practice and skill to be able to start to look in both directions and start to wonder in both directions too, not for a hard answer, but this is the way it has to be. But again, that capacity for wondering starts to be a type of Sabbath. Um, mm -hmm. Or, you know, as Hannah Arendt says, um, thinking with banisters as opposed to thinking without banisters. Um, I don't understand. Hannah Arendt, um, the famous uh, writer, talks about, I think she wrote this in the 30s, said that she was seeing a proclivity for. Um, for th when we go up and down our thinking that we so often know where we want to get to so quickly that we think without banisters and we start to fall up or down. Mm. And that she, she was calling for uh, a slower approach to the mm. manner of thinking, so to, so to think with banisters. Mm. Um, and so I would say wondering with banisters is like, okay, let's look at this and start to apply some good wondering here. like. And not just rush to like, oh yes, trees always good, or no trees bad, or you know, always mm -hmm. look, always use history as the lens, or mm -hmm. um, like, let's actually like hold the banister, take a step. Um, so just to you know, Hannah Arendt is amazing, but not to enthrone her, but like it's a nice turn of phrase. Yeah, Think, thinking without banisters. And it, it's happening a lot now with conspiracy theory stuff for sure. A lot of thinking without banisters. Like, what's an example when you, you say conspiracy theories? Uh, anything that having to do with uh, COVID denialism or uh, or catastrophizing about vaccines, for example, I mean, that's a lot of thinking without banisters. Mm, not, mm -hmm. 
let's leave aside right or wrong, but right. not cautious uh, thinking, not good thinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so now, thank you for taking the time to explain that concept of um, wondering with banisters because it, if I tie it back to the improv, it, it goes to the point, point of, you know, um, acknowledging or honoring the Sabbath and, and pausing and, and allowing for time to reflect and let things sink in. Um, so and this goes back, this goes back, just as you said, like uh, when you're asking about like, well, with improv, have you brought this into your life? Like I'm doing it. I didn't yeah. even know I was doing it and I was doing it. Yeah. I'm yeah. an amazing improviser. You in are here. amazing, just, Matthew. <laughs> so good. And we got to call right Amy Poehler, tell her <laughs> she can yeah. be very proud of her. One of her she first can students. Be. She can be. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I want to, we're we have a little more time and I really want to now spend some time with a project you started, I think back in 2009. Mm-hmm. Okay. So listeners, um, you know, I remember I described Matthew as a deep thinker, a listener, rather a professional problem solver, a reimaginer. Well, in 2009, he set up two chairs and a table in Union Square in New York City, offering creative approaches to what other people have been thinking. So I want to um hear anything you want to share about that either how you, it what inspired you to start maybe some um nuggets of, of stories and, and exchanges you have with people i i did hear uh, an interview with a guy that you were telling that there, there had been some kind of um maybe physical altercation with some man over space and i never found where i could read that story um i don't know if you want to share that one or another one so sure. go for it um so in 2009, um, which you may recall was, you know, there was a big economic crash that happened then. I would just been finishing taking a course called Creativity and Personal Mastery, which is a personal development course, which is, you know, I, I, taught, I, I taught it for a number of years after I took it uh, or co-taught it. Um, so like, I think the course is fine, but like, it's, maybe it's a, a hand on the gate latch of, uh personal spiritual work it's like i wouldn't say like it's the the best thing or the worst thing it's like it's hand on the gate latch okay <laughs> um well you haven't actually gone in so a lot of people <laughs> mistake the, you know, the the gate latch for like arrival um there's still more, more to go um but like not a bad gate latch um <laughs> not a rusty so, one you know even if it's rusty like that's okay um i mean again but there's more space to go into um but you, you never mistake the, the road sign for the, the place you're trying to get to. Um, you see, you know, Paducah, Kentucky on a big green sign on the highway. You don't think like, I've arrived. Like, no, <laughs> keep going. Um, I don't know why I picked Paducah, but um, I did. I have no idea. So there's that great song by Benny Goodman, the Paducah. Um, do you know it? I do not. You want to sing a couple? Paducah, if you want to, you can rhyme it with bazooka. And it goes and it goes on. It's okay. Now that you sing it, it does sound like I've it's a heard duet. It. It's a duet with Carmen Miranda. Uh, it's really good. It's really fun. Benny um, and Carmen singing Paducah. Yeah, just Benny Goodman okay. Paducah. You'll find it. It's great. Okay. Good. Uh, I recommend it to anyone else. It's you know it's great. Um, so I took this class on the last uh, exercise that we had. Is we all wrote anonymous love letters to everyone else who was in the class. And you sort of got this bundle of 24, 25 pages uh, of notes that people had said kind things about you. Um, and so on the last day, I got this bundle and it said a lot of nice things, which was, you know, you're so good at helping us look at things and never giving advice and creative approaches and you should find a way of doing things with that and you've, you know, whatever. And I'd heard these things before, but never sort of all at once. And I just gotten laid off because of the uh, economic collapse like two weeks before the course ended. Um, I had another job that I know was starting in August or September, my feature length documentary film about the origins of poverty was coming out. I knew that I have like a paid job then. So I thought that the likelihood of me being able to get a summer gig when the economy had just collapsed was nil. Um, and so I thought, like a good improviser, I'm going to say yes to this suggestion and try to find a way to do something with this. 
uh, but I had no particular credentials um, and I wanted to make it very easy. So I, um, I bought two folding chairs and a table and printed a sign that said creative approaches to what you've been thinking about. Put another small sign on the table that said, pay what you like or take what you need and put a little jar full of money there. And I set myself out on April 1st, 2009 at, um, well, I got there at, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, something like that. Um, and on that first day, there was a different point in the day, a line to talk with me um, about all sorts of things. And I thought, and you know, and I made some money on that day. Um, and I was really like, wow, I guess this, this is a thing. And so I just started to sit out there really regularly, getting there in the morning, sitting there until early evening. And it was like my job. Um, um, though I haven't really done it at all in two and a half years because of the pandemic and because I only do it when the weather is nice. Right. You know, round numbers, I've sat out there for 10 plus years, 10ish uh, years, sat with, around 5,000 people, helping people look at whatever is going on in their lives, big or small, personal or professional, weird or totally mundane. I try not to ever give advice um, and try to help people cultivate a relationship with whatever they're wondering about, but from a slightly different direction and just drawing on you know, whatever it is I might know or whatever um, in possible to just sort of think about on the fly. So it employed my improv skills, mm -hmm. employed my listening skills, which are of course cultivated in improv and a lot of mm -hmm. my sort of philosophical wondering, but also just sort of like weirdo skills too. Yeah. Um, to just uh, be employed that way. Yeah. And so over all the years, you know, I, I wanna, when you're out there, um, people could pay me in money or hugs or Tic Tacs or chopsticks or art and they did. Uh, uh, and people took money too, sometimes too. Mm -hmm. I only had $9 taken over the years. Maybe it was 10, but I think nine is right. Wow. Um, which is totally fine. Um, and then also that turned into a create uh, a consultancy for me that if you wanted to find me in the park, you know, you could have basically unlimited amount of time with me for whatever you wanted or make money off it. Um, but if you wanted to do something with me on your own time that wasn't there, I had a rate. Um, and I ended up working with individuals and businesses to help them do the same thing, but on their time. Um, and it, I started to write down some of the stories that happened out there, which I found useful or funny or cool or thoughtful or mm -hmm. might, might be uh, of service to people. And um, yeah, it was an amazing, amazing thing that I stumbled into. Yeah. And I can see how important the improv is because one of the things I think that to be able to do improv or willing to improv is the willingness of um, feeling like an idiot, um, un, you know, just in that we have no clue what's coming and not there's so many people who wouldn't be able to survive that first day <laughs> of yeah. just being with not knowing, not having a clue. Um, I can see how that has probably served you. Yeah, absolutely. And just um, because one person's issue is different from the next person. You just don't know what your scene partner is going to bring. And so you just have to, mm -hmm. you know, in the same way that when you stepped out on stage with your playback theater, like I'm just going to step out on stage and see who shows up. Yeah. I, one of my favorite um, scenes was I step out on st stage or I was on stage and um, I was pretending be, to be the mom in the story and um, I'm going into a temple and then um, everyone left. And for some reason, I didn't leave the stage and I'm, my brain's going, oh, shit. <laughs> now what? And um, in, in an I'm walking forward, not knowing, not knowing, not knowing, just looking at this calm face. And the next thing I know is I transform into the kids and do another scene. And it, it's one of my 
just favorite memories of trusting the moment and you know the getting the response from the audience that you know that gave them a lot of delight as well uh, so yeah so um as you're starting to get near to the end is there a, a story from all of those years of sitting at union square that uh you're, you'd like to share um i mean of course there's so many i mean one that um always touches me is there's a, a woman um, who, who showed up and she could tell that she was once a very beautiful woman, but she had some sort of um, palsy um, that was starting to like distort her face. Um, and she asked, um, is there, I'm looking for a creative approach to keeping my brain sharp. And I just, without sort of making any assumption, I said sort of like, why? And she's like, yeah, I'm just interested. And so we just talked about a bunch of different stuff, you know. Um, but at one point I said to her, you know, another thing you can do, we could try it now, is we can have a, a conversation in numbers. And she said, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, it's an improv game. I said, so I'm gonna say one, you're gonna say two, I'm gonna say three, you're gonna say four, three easy, we're gonna have a conversation to 20. Um, but you have to say one in such a way that I know what you mean. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna say two in the way that like, et cetera. And she was like, okay, great. So when she says one, I mean, the way that she said it, she was positioned in such a way that it, the image that I got immediately is that she was, you know, a young woman who probably at the end of a night on a date in the 1950s sort of was like I don't want to go but I have to go but I'm sort of want to stay sort of a vibe uh -huh. I just sort of saw that from the her position the way she said it yeah and so for me I was like oh so for me my my two was well, I'm gonna to try to get you to stay <laughs> I'm gonna to try to like you know do this and so we had this conversation where it just started to be like this and this woman I would say was older than my mother mm. Um, and it just started to like, and the, you know, we, we know the lines, one, two, right, three, four, right, five, right. <laughs> um, but it was all the intention. And it got to the point where it just like, I had convinced her to stay and we were getting physically closer and we got to 14 and she says, I don't think we need to go all the way to 20. <laughs> and, and she laughed and she put her hands on my face and she said, I haven't been spoken to mm. that way or being seen as that beautiful in so long. And that has meant more to me than anything else. And she kissed me. We didn't make out on the street, but you know, maybe you, I don't know when you last kissed someone, but there's that in, in a way person you didn't know you were going to kiss. Right. Where their where their mouth opens up with sort of that that longing, just like. Oh, it's about to feel the the breath of you you're drawn into theirs and it's just all sweetness and it's all openness and it's all hunger and this woman kissed me with like with a deep gratitude of that and so she didn't know that she was looking to be recognized as yeah. beautiful that was the creative approach oh Matthew thank you for that um we're going to have to wrap up I'm going to see if I can get do this in the next 45 seconds <laughs> And I would, I want listeners, you're going to want to hear the rest of those stories. There's only, I think, a handful, maybe there's more that they can find, Matthew. Though, go to his website, stillmansays.com, go to the send, blogs. Sure, but also go to send it to Primal Derma. I, I talk more about culture making. Yeah, yeah. you do. Yeah. yeah, go check out the Primal Derma. Yes, dot com, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was fascinating read as well. And listeners, be sure to switch on, tune in, listen up, and be inspired next week when I'm going to be speaking with Sari Ibrahim. Like it or not, our brains are wired to keep us safe, and our experience and environments then, and our experiences and environments then determine what safe really means. For, I don't know what I'm just saying. Anyway, just um, this interview with Sari is going to be really interesting because he's going to help us to break the cycle of this safety net that we have in our brains. There we go. I got it. Um, and Matthew, thank you. This has been a wonderful conversation. Thanks so much for inviting me.
Absolutely. We can thank Emma as well. Yes, we can. Thank you, Emma. And listeners, you've been listening to Partner Up with Amy Carroll on the Voice America Business Channel. Happy partnering, everyone. 